So we are in session 9 and uh, we are into a core uh, programming model called the object oriented programming. We'll see all those um, um, key terminologies and their implications and how they are related to the real world. Everything in detail, a drill down detail into the object oriented programming, especially for C sharp dot net and VB.NET programs. And we also see a object based programming model and what is the difference between the OOP and OBP, we'll see that also. It's kind of an overview, it's not in detail, but we will be jumping into too many details of OOP uh, in this session. And also, uh, at the end, we will also touch base on the aspect-oriented programming called AOP uh, and uh, what it means and how it is different from all the other pro programming models. Okay, so let's kick off with the OOP today. Okay, so today, today uh, the most uh, important or most chatted word, object-oriented programming, uh, all the concepts that we're going to talk. Um, so if you look at the resources available around the uh, internet on this topic, uh, you will find uh, so many topics, so many articles, so many, so much of information available outside. Um, but um, fortunately, each of that, each of those informations are addressing to a different level of understanding of what is object-oriented programming. And most of the times, uh, for beginners, it's going to be more uh, difficult to understand. Uh, uh, believe me, it is one of the most simplest uh, topic. Uh, if it is not told correctly, it will be more complicated. Uh, and uh, if you think it is more complicated, then, uh, uh, then try to think again. It's not that complicated. So I'll try to put it in a very simple uh, real-time uh, implementation perspective. So uh, that's the reason I started with this slide. Uh, so to understand the real uh, world of the object-oriented programming, uh, we just have to look around uh, in our day-to-day -day life and see what all you see. So to, before we look into that uh, uh, kind of an aspect, uh, what we need to see is how the programming was pr prior to this. It was pretty much a structure-oriented programming, uh, and most of you have never worked in a legacy coding, so you will never uh, even un know that how the structured programming works. It's pretty much like a function-based programming. If you look at the Clipper or Fox Pro uh, programs uh, with the legacy code, um, they pretty much uh, coded based on the functionality, it's straightforward to the functionality. If you say, for example, uh, I do a billing system, so in a billing what happens, you take, uh, you scan an item, an item is fitted, the item uh, code is uh, keyed in, and you look it up into the rate and get the rate and done. So it's all function based. So, um, and the major hurdle with the function based or uh, um, structured oriented programming uh, uh, is that the re reusability of aspects is more complicated. Uh, most of the cases, uh, it, uh, because you write uh, functions for everything and you achieve the uh, requirement spec and you're done, your application works good. But now once you get into the changes or scalability or, or extendability of the application, it's almost equal to zero because you cannot extend the functionality beyond a certain point. So all you can do is you can have to edit the respective functions every time uh, and you cannot extend those functionalities to a, a larger uh, system down the line. So um, so eventually uh, it's pretty much uh, back dated in uh, 1950s around uh, the, the thought process of object-oriented programming evolved and it evolved uh, based on the key concept of object. If you see the object, we have seen uh, what is an object, what is a class so far. So the concept of object itself is a base for the object-oriented programming. Okay, so the we'll see um, uh, how, how, how it is different from the structured-oriented programming. Okay. Um, so if you see the real world around you, so you'll see a lot of objects around you. As a table, I try to figure out how to show you. And I found a nice picture um, on the internet uh, that uh, shows a wide variety of objects around us. 
So whenever you write a program uh, with respect to, to a uh, business context, right, so we, uh, the thought process, in other words, the, there's another topic called object-oriented thought process. Uh, there are a couple of books available on, um, uh, on this topic, especially uh, object-oriented thought process. So what the thought process ideally goes behind is that uh, whenever you write a program, you, pr you think the program um, uh, as a ma real-time mapping to the real-world objects. Um, so in simple terms, so if you see if you see a rabbit or an airplane or a desk or furniture, uh, egg, uh, earphone, so on. So you see a lot of different objects in a real-time life. And similarly, the thought process of a programming design, designing a program, goes around uh, defining these objects. So that uh, if you write a program that uh, matches the real-time business objects then it makes it easy for you to extend it or scale it around. Okay, so that's the base behind the object oriented thought process. So quickly jumping into the what are those uh, uh, elements that really make a language as a object oriented programming. So there are a wide variety of languages available. As I mentioned, a couple of them are uh, C, C++, Java, uh, VB.NET, C Sharp, VB6.0, uh, Python, uh, so on. Uh, there are a wide variety of languages. So in order to qualify a language to be called as an object-oriented programming language, so it needs to actually satisfy these uh, seven set of uh, um, concepts. Um, in other words, uh, the highlighted four, last four, if you see, look at the material outside, you will see they, whenever you, they talk about object-oriented programming, they always refer to the, only the last four. Um, so in, uh, in general, uh, in theory, if a language is supposed to be categorized as object-oriented programming language, then it need to satisfy all these seven uh, set of uh, concepts. So we have already seen what is a class and object in the previous sessions and uh, we'll see uh, them again uh, today. So the seven uh, aspects are the class, the object, the message passing, in other words simply message, um, the fourth one is encapsulation, fifth is abstraction, sixth is polymorphism and seventh is inheritance. So these are the seven um, um, cat, uh, characteristics that a language should possess to be qualified as an object-oriented programming language. Okay, so we'll see one of uh, each of them uh, <clears throat> in detail. So the first one is a class. We have already seen the class and uh, we will see a different dimension to a class today. So when we declare a class, um, in simple words, it defines the state and the behavior of a class. So the state and behavior, um, so, um, so if you see the class has two uh, aspects, uh, main two aspects are the state and behavior. So this is, these are the two characteristics that any uh, living object or any object if you see around uh, will possess. The state is normally defined, uh, uh, represents the properties. If you see a real time uh, object like this, um, so um, uh, the class as a, as a different dimension to a class. Uh, it provides the definition of the state and behavior of an object. So, um, so the behavior in a, another term is an action word, um, which means uh, it's a verb in uh, which has some action to it. So, uh, so every objects do something. Some objects do nothing, but they have their representations. Uh, or like a flower vase, if you see, it might not have any action items but uh, it resembles uh, something, some meaning to the, uh, to the real world. Um, so it, it, it is used for decoration, in other words. So usage-wise is another word. So another, another dimension to that is a usage, okay? Uh, the properties, if you look at um, that a object possess, uh, in this example is a pretty uh, familiar example, is the car. If you take a car as an example, uh, on the left hand side if you see the state uh, the state of a car how you define a, the color of the car the number of doors or number of wheels or has headlights um, 
um, and the number of windows and so on. So these are all uh, attributes or parameters or, or in simple uh, coding, coding wise properties of an object represents the state. And the behavior, as I mentioned, um, is the action items uh, that a, uh, the, uh, the object can possess. So uh, what car can do, a car can honk, it can start, stop, dry, or open trunk, and so on. So there are a number of uh, action items that a car can do. So in, if you compare the class definition, so it pretty much has the state and behavior uh, information with it. So why it is a blueprint? If you look at a normal blueprint, um, uh, so in, in a single word, if someone asks you what is a class, so the single line answer would be uh, a class is a blueprint of an object. Okay, so it's a single statement. You don't have to worry about it. And uh, if you know what is a blueprint, and most, uh, most of your engineering graduates know what is a blueprint, and this is uh, a blueprint of a car. So it pretty much show you the complete uh, spe spec of the, uh, the object that need to be produced out. Okay, so even if it is for look at an architectural diagram of or, or the a blueprint of the uh, of a building or so on. So this is a bedroom, this is a dining room, and so on. So it has uh, specific dimensions and specific attributes attached to each of the components that need to be developed. So needless to uh, prolong on this, uh, this is um, a pretty much straightforward. So in general, class will have the definition. Remember it has a definition of a state and behavior of an object. So many times we'll get confused with the class and object. So that's the reason I'm stressing out here more. So in the coding perspective, if you go um, map your um, blueprint in terms of a code, right? So if you see the code here, uh, class car, all these, the state definition is pretty much using a properties here. So, um, so this is a short form of writing a properties wherein uh, I avoided having a local variable and exposing them using a property. So to make this uh, look simple, uh, but this is a valid statement though. Uh, you can still uh, write properties uh, without having local variables defined uh, when you don't want to enforce getters and setters. Um, so this is the feature available from .NET uh, language, uh, I believe uh, 2.0. Uh, wherein you can have a short form of uh, uh, properties. And uh, behavior is defined in terms of methods here. Uh, so all these methods like start, drive, honk, these methods will define the behavioral aspects of the class car. So in code, if you see, this is a raw code. Here I'm going to write what this start going to do, what this drive going to do, what this honk going to do. So this is pretty much the blueprint. So I'm going to define what this uh, action going to perform and what this property going to hold. What, uh, so I'm defining these in terms of a code uh, uh, by writing class. So the class is a definition of your object. Okay, so properties will define the state and the methods will define the behavior. So it's pretty much clear. And the, on the right hand side, if you see, this is a class diagram. Um, so U UML, if you have ever uh, heard of it, or definitely you might have heard of uh, UML uh, modeling, uh, unified uh, modeling language. Uh, using UML, you normally uh, uh, define the class diagrams, and this is a class diagram um, uh, that Visual Studio, uh, the architectural edition, uh, provides. Uh, if you have the Visual Studio with the architecture edi edition, then you will uh, also be able to see uh, the, uh, the class view of your code. So the left hand side is the class and the right hand side is the class view, uh, or the class diagram in other words. Okay, so pretty much the UML class diagram uh, looks the same. Uh, it will have the on, the, on the top, it will have the name of the class and its type. Uh, it's a car, is a class uh, of type, uh, a stereotype is a class. And it has fields, and here I'm adding the fields. Uh, uh, right now, don't worry about that. We worry about the properties and methods, and uh, the list of properties and methods that are available within the class. So this is a typical class diagram. Okay, so now what is an object? <clears throat> 
So we have a blueprint. Now the, each of the uh, blueprint specified the details of uh, how this should be, how the door should be, uh, what the honk do, what the drive do, what the stop do, and so on. We have defined it uh, in the blueprint, which is our class. So once you create an instance of that, um, it becomes an object. So if you see the class and object are interrelated to each other. Uh, so th that's the confusion people do normally have uh, whenever people ask what is a class and what is an object. So if someone asks what is a class, a class is a blueprint of an object. And what is an object? An object is an instance of a class. That's straightforward. Both are definitely interrelated. Okay, so you create, you define the class visualizing some concept. So car is a uh, is a uh, realization of that concept, and we see car in our day-to-day -day life. If you think about a flying car, which is again uh, becoming a real uh, in the today's market again, uh, probably not in the market, but uh, technically people have been working out to have a flying car. So flying car is a concept that is visualized and you, you don't see it normally in the road today. Uh, so if you start defining the uh, the state and behavior of a, a flying car and uh, that becomes your blueprint and once the blueprint is transformed into a real-time object it becomes a object and which you can see feel and do things on top of it so so object is a realization of a class in other words you can say it. so the class is a blueprint so okay keep in mind um, so in, in a simple context here uh, we have a blueprint of a car which is sent to the manufacturing unit and the manufacturer has manufactured multiple instances of that blueprint. So that's the difference between a, a class. A class is going to have only one copy in the memory. So once the compiler loads the class into the memory, you can actually create any number of instances of that type. Okay, you can have a, here if you see the car, red, blue, green, so on. And each of the instance has its own state. State instance, each of the uh, object here, if you see, uh, this car has its own state, saying it has uh, its own color. Uh, it might have its own wheels in terms of alloy wheels or normal wheels or so on. So you have types of wheels and types of horn again. Um, honking is again not the same. You can have customize it, your own horn, what kind of sound you want to produce out, so on. So so the state can be different for each of these instances, but they're all instances of the same class. So the state and behavior can be modified uh, using your messages. So we'll see that uh, in the next sessions, uh, next um, slides. So the object, in other words, uh, we are um, creating an object. Uh, we have seen the definition of an object, and uh, we are creating an instance of that um, class. Here, car is a a class and C1 is an instance of that class. So I'm setting its state here and I'm invoking its behavior. And this is a real-time picture of a car. So when I, when I run my program, I will see this out because I, that's how I coded it and it's, that's what it is doing. Uh, at this stage, uh, the car implementation has nothing but uh, showing the parameters outside, uh, displaying its uh, state, in other words. And the state can be modified by calling its methods, okay? So by calling its messages, so messaging is the integral part of it. And message, messaging is a wide topic again, and with respect to the, um, so wide topic in, in sense, uh, the messages can be um, uh, between the processes, between the threads, or it can be out of process, out of machine, out of networks, and so on. So the message is a wide, wide concept to talk about. It's pretty much, uh, um, it's a message passing is uh, a communication channel through which uh, multiple objects talk to each other. Uh, in object-oriented programming, it is uh, pretty much the same, uh, wherein the objects involved in talking to each other uh, 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 while running the program. So to make your program successfully, the objects will communicate to each other. Uh, in, if you again translate this to a real-time picture, uh, if you say a, 
um, a, an object, uh, a human, right? As a, a employee, an employee, uh, employee, uh, and relationship with the uh, with the department. Say, for example, so uh, there is an association between the department and an employee because the employee belongs to a department. So, um, so they both communicate to each other in one way or the other during your real-time application. So that kind of messaging is uh, yeah, is provided using the concept called message message passing. Okay. Um, so the message passing in in this example, it's a very same example wherein I'm passing the uh, values to the uh, to define the state, and also invoking the methods. Um, to, uh, to alter the state, in other words, okay? And uh, so the real-time uh, object in the real-time is going to uh, reflect the state that has been modified by your code, okay? Um, the next, so the core concept uh, called the encapsulation comes into play. So encapsulation uh, 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 means that the uh, internal representation of an object is generally hidden from uh, view outside of the object's definition. So it's uh, pretty much uh, hiding uh, the data structures or the state of a class interface. Uh, it means multiple things. Um, number one, uh, you can actually, uh, it, it also means that the internal implementation details has been hidden from the outside. Okay, so if you see the previous one, when I'm setting C1 is equal to uh, C1 dot make is equal to Nissan, Nissan, I really don't know what's uh, what's happening internally uh, with make uh, make implementation, or even I when I'm calling the dot start, I even don't know what's the internal logic doing it, which you do not worry about again. So even in in uh, real time, if you translate, uh, if you're playing a uh, audio system. All you care is that audio should be audible and nothing else. So when you play, when you hit the play button, it should start playing. When you hit pause button, it should stop. So what, as an end user, uh, you expect from that uh, functionality of uh, the behavior of that particular object is that you don't really worry about what's happening internally. You all worry about what you want from outside. So the internal implementation logic is hidden or encapsulated. Uh, so capsule, if you remember, it's capsuling means putting things inside and you don't worry about it. So relate the term to encapsulation. So when you encapsulate uh, the uh, uh, implementation from outside, uh, the concept translate to the encapsulation. Uh, so one of the example we have here is uh, using a property um, I'm having a local variable here, which is a private member. By default, if you declare any um, local variables, it, it defaults to a private. Uh, in this example, I didn't specify explicitly private, but uh, uh, implicitly it defaults to private. So the int unique ID, we have seen the previous examples that this is a local variable, and this cannot be accessed from the, uh, from the instance of this class. So this can be accessed only using the unique ID uh, as a property. And what's happening within the unique ID? Unique ID is actually uh, updating or returning the value that is saved to the local variable. So what this achieved, uh, this is a simple example. Uh, well, using properties, you can uh, implement the encapsulation. Uh, in, in sense, this adds a um, layer of an interface for the end user using a public keyword. So we haven't gone through the more of the access modifiers so far, so we have seen only the private and public. Uh, so the public will get, uh, only using public uh, access modifiers, you can expose the members to the, um, the one who is using your class. In this case, so all the members you can access are of public. Okay, so encapsulation is a pro, uh, is a um, method of uh, uh, hiding the your internal implementation. It can be achieved using the access modifiers um, and exposing the uh, access modifiers can be applied even for the, your methods. So method implementation, nobody really care. All they need is they call it and get it. Okay, so. So every aspect is actually transformed to a real world. Uh, that's the key uh, uh, 
note that we need to keep in mind when we all when we talk about the object oriented so any keyword that you see down the line uh, with respect to the code right now uh, will be transformed to the real world objects okay if it is not then you're actually deviating away from the object oriented principles okay the next one is uh, abstraction I think before uh, we step in uh, to the next topic, let me take a quick demo. Uh, I think uh, we have already covered this uh, um, aspects uh, before, uh, so I don't want to go and uh, do a small demos. But still, for those who want to uh, uh, recap or revise their memory, I would, uh, I will still allow to do it. Okay, so the so far we have uh, seen uh, the the class and objects. I will just like to uh, put a small demo there. I'll just run the code that I already have. Uh, in in this case, I just have a high level class uh, stating an automobile, um, and I'm creating an instance of that uh, as a car here. I'm trying to. This is the same example that we see in the slides. And um, so we see the uh, uh, automobile is the class and car is the object. So that's the distinction there. Uh, or in other words, we refer this as an instance member. Um, so car is an instance of an automobile. So if you see the hierarchical representation of your entire automobile industry, car is car falls one of them. So I'm trying to demonstrate that here. And uh, and of course, the car has a make, model, wheels, and so on. Um, and uh, encapsulation aspect uh, is a pretty much the method. So I just classified the whole automobile into a state and behavior, wherein within the state I have a set of properties and a couple of other things. Uh, the constructor and the property. So this is one of the property which uh, actually implements the encapsulation, wherein it hides the private member, which is the model here. This is a private member. It is hiding the private member uh, from being exposed outside, and it's controlling the access to the private members using a public property. So here I have a control on uh, uh, what values I can set and how uh, I can return it out. So that's the advantage of having property. So this is a typical implementation of an encapsulation principle. Okay. So if I run this code, it's pretty much uh, um, calling three uh, methods of the automobile class and uh, the values that are assigned to it are Nissan Maxima and latitude longitude. So I just had a latitude and longitude to the, uh, as a state uh, because car is a mobile uh, object so it can move from one uh, location to another location. So it track the state of the uh, object that's one of the uh, means uh, uh, I just added and it has number of uh, wheels of four. Okay, so uh, that's still the uh, concept of encapsulation. So we'll move ahead. Next comes the abstraction. So abstraction uh, uh, is a very, very confusing topic, though different authors uh, define it in different ways. Uh, so I see this is one of the best way to uh, explain it or visualize uh, what does an abstraction means. Okay, so in in general, if you look at the English definition, uh, uh, abstraction is a concept or idea not associated with a specific instance. Okay, so that's the key there. And if you understand the basic English meaning, then you will know what is an abstraction is. Okay, so what it means is is a concept or an idea not to associate any with any specific instance. Okay, for example, um, if you look at the chart below, so this is a pretty, pretty much the animal classification diagram um, or chart. So in this, I, I we have all the five uh, classifications of the animal kingdom. Wherein we have mammals, uh, reptiles, uh, fish, birds, and so on. So if you look at this chart, what have uh, the definition of the abstraction is uh, pretty much clear there. If you start defining a, a program that represents the animal kingdom, so how will you design your classes? So it's a pretty much a, uh, you follow a chart 
which classifies all the identified uh, objects and generalize them to form into a groups so that you always ensure that you will keep only the information within a given class to what it is needed and what can be um, generalization concept uh, in the UML terms means uh, you're actually grouping them grouping the related objects into one so that you can share the commonality so why we are sharing commonality why because we want to reuse the commonality so remember um, the core principles behind all the programming uh, uh, patterns or paradigm is to reusability, extendability, scalability, everything. So everything falls uh, under the reusability. So as simple as I don't want to write the same code a number of times in my application. So it, it's all write once and use many times. So, uh, so that's the principle goes behind everything. Um, so reusability is a key concept and the abstraction gives you uh, that flexibility to uh, have the reusability driven at a multiple levels. Uh, but this is again a thought process again. As I was talking about object-oriented thought process uh, is, uh, is a thought process that will think about the real-time objects classified into a chart like this. So if, you have, uh, if there, there was none or no biologist or zoologist to sit, uh, sitting around and try to classify all these animals, we would never had this chart. So we, they have classified based on some common characteristics. Each of these objects possess in the real world. Okay, so insects have their own characteristics and uh, amphibians have their own characteristics. But though all of these uh, characteristics are shared as a common, they are called animal carrot, animal classification. So they are belongs to animal, and another another dimension to it is the all of them are living beings, uh, living things, so on. So that's the kind of abstraction when you say so. Uh, it's a concept or idea not to associate with any specific instance. So the abstraction for in this diagram, if you see, the animal is an abstract layer, or in the next level of abstraction is insects for animal and at the same time animal at the high level and the low level is again the respective subsets uh, which is insects or amphibians or mammals or reptiles or fish birds and so on so that's how the classification goes on so what you're achieving with this we're achieving the common characteristics as grouped as one so when I have an abstract class so if I if I say uh, in the real car example um, I have defined the automobile as an abstract class. Okay, so we'll just see the next one. Yeah, this is a similar example uh, wherein uh, the animal classification is shown, wherein animals becomes the abstract layer at the top, and the respective uh, are classified down down the, down the line. Okay, so in this this chart, this is a typical real time uh, code example that I have. <clears throat> wherein I'm just classified the automobile industry wherein we already see uh, the automobile class and uh, which is an abstract class okay I just changed it uh, to uh, to the more the first part so I will roll it back um, to an abstract class so in uh, in the coding perspectives uh, you can achieve abstraction using the uh, abstract class and also inheritance um, and also using your um, uh, access modifiers, of course, implicitly everything uh, falls under the same root. Um, so if you see the arrows that are uh, pointing at out, uh, the arrow represents the generalization in UM, UML terms. In other words, in uh, object-oriented terms, it is an inheritance uh, link. So if you see the truck is inheriting automobile, car is inheriting automobile, SUVs, scooter and so on are inheriting from automo automobile directly because they all fall under the same umbrella. But here the flying car is actually inheriting a car because a flying car is a special class of car. Uh, so that's why it's rooted out from a car. So although it looks, and looks like a car, but this car normally runs on the road. The specialization of the flying car is that it can fly and also drive on the road. So that's kind of a classification we have here. Okay, and remember 
this diagram also uh, show you one uh, important message here. The thing is, um, we can see car, okay? We can see car, and we can see tons of cars out there on the road. And flying car is also we can see right now in YouTube. Uh, trucks we can see in day-to-day -day life, SUVs I can, scooters I can. So these are all objects that I can see uh, outside. So I can cre create an instance of this to become an object. So the object represents the real-time world, real-time object. So the automobile, there's nothing called automobile, right? So there's nothing called automobile that I can see. So automobile is a concept, it's a classification. So that cannot be instantiated, right? So if you translate this diagram um, to the real-time objects, so there is nothing called an automobile, only that an automobile is just a high-level classification of all these uh, objects that you see. So that's why so high-level classification cannot exist in the real world. So the classification is just a thought process or an idea or a concept um, which can be only on books. So that's why abstract classes cannot be instantiated. So when I make this um, abstract, so that's what the error shows. Okay, so we cannot create um, an instance of the abstract class or interface. So interfaces are other way to uh, achieve the abstraction. So you cannot create an in, um, uh, instance of them. So if you translate that rule in your programming language into real-time um, implementation, you can uh, clearly say that you cannot create instance of an abstract class or interface. So you will never forget it. Okay, so that's the abstraction. And now comes the another important aspect of a polymorphism. If you have any doubts on abstraction, so I try to put it in the simplest way so that you it sits in your memory. Um, I am a little fortunate in my career that uh, um, uh, I learned um, object-oriented principles from one of a very good teacher. And, um, and st I still remember those concepts today and try able to tell you um, so I have seen uh, folks who are completely scared of object-oriented programming and w what what is this Greek word and all other things. But uh, trust me, it really helps uh, uh, the way you present it and I hope you are getting it clearly. Okay, so polymorphism, if you see, um, it, it's the, the word itself is derived from a Greek, Greek word, which means uh, having multiple forms. Uh, so since it is a Greek word, it is not, it is good. It's kind of an alien uh, a keyword. It is a polymorphism. It, or it really doesn't re relates to an English uh, for us to uh, grasp it easily. So if you see polytechnic uh, is another way. So poly means many. Okay, polymorphism. In other words, uh, is called form. So why I'm stressing this way? Because you relate the, uh, the if you relate these keywords to the real time meaning, then you will definitely will never forget what does this mean. So you will never forget uh, your confused between abstraction, a polymorphism, I think it's other way around, things like that. So I've seen people uh, get confused between these two words or interrelate these words. So if you expand this uh, clearly, then you will uh, remember it um, much better way. So polymorphism uh, is a, uh, poly itself stands for multiple, and morphism is forms. So it means multiple forms. So when you say multiple forms, then we'll, you will know whatever we're going to talk now, okay? So in programming, we can implement the multiple definitions of the same <coughs> name or method or function with variable parameters. So uh, in, in, it has multiple different types of polymorphism, but all of them uh, core aspect is if you have a method or, or a function, so all you can do is you have the same name shared uh, with variable parameters to have a different definition to it. So in other words, uh, how you relate this to a real-time uh, real world. 
Uh, it's a typical example uh, I could think of uh, out of my head, if you see. Uh, um, it's more like an artificial intelligence, uh, but I, may, I might be going too long. Uh, if you see um, uh, the way you uh, communicate to others, you the way you react to things, right? Uh, you might say um, hello as a simple way, simple way, or you might say hello in a different way or a different context. So hello itself has a different meaning based on how you invoke it or how you say it out, right? So in real term, in real world, uh, so if the object is trying to communicate to other object, uh, uh, that communication might be the same communication, but based on the context, the meaning might change. So that you you will see that uh, in in the real world every every day to day life. So in the, even in English, uh, there are so many instances you will come across that the meaning of a certain word will change based on the context that you use the word. Um, so that's the real world transformation if you look at. So the polymorphism similarly achieves the same thing. So you have the same name uh, having different meaning based on a different context. Okay, so the meaning is uh, uh, is your definition, uh, how you write it. Let me get into the code so that you can uh, have a quick glimpse. So I'll take this typical example of uh, the automobile. In this, I have a start. Uh, the start method, uh, uh, in this case, uh, the context uh, is defined in terms of the number of parameters that I'm passing in. So here I have a same name with two different contexts, which is two different set of parameters passed in and also they have their own body. So in this case I'm doing just writing something and in this case I'm actually doing little more than just writing it down. I'm just incrementing some values based on the, oops sorry. Okay. So this is what a polymorphism means. So sharing the same name uh, uh, and uh, defining its own context, uh, defining its own body based on the context. So the context here is defined based on the parameters that I'm passing in and it has a different uh, body to be called. Okay, so how many types of polymorphisms we have? Uh, so this is again a wide uh, uh, topic of uh, uh, variance definitions you'll see on, on the uh, on the internet or the or the the flow folks all, all around on the community. Um, so generally, at the high level, if you say people might start directly with the low level, like they can say, "What is how many types of polymorphism you have? You have uh, method overloading, method operator overloading, or oper uh, method overriding. Uh, that's all three things you have. But if you really classify them based on the uh, based on uh, how they are or in which context they are being used, then you can classify the high level as an ad hoc polymorphism and the parameterized polymorphism. So parameterized polymorphism is uh, um, probably I might uh, show you uh, down the line when we talk about generics. Uh, so you can achieve that using generics wherein uh, you create an object um, and uh, you, uh, the way you initialize the object will change the behavior of it. So there again, you will use the same uh, name for a different use, but at a class level. Okay, so the level at which you use uh, the, as a parameter as polymorphism is, will change. Uh, so here it is completely at a very high level, wherein uh, you can define a class with respect to constructor of a, a generic type uh, based on the type that you pass in when you create the uh, instance of that class, uh, its behavior will be different. So uh, that is a, a concept of uh, generics. So when we talk about generics, uh, probably I will uh, demo the parameterized polymorphism. Okay, and uh, the ad hoc polymorphism is what we're going to see today. Under this ad hoc polymorphism, we have two types of polymorphisms. One is at compile time, and other one is at runtime. Okay, so compile time polymorphism is grouped again into two. One is a method overloading, operator overloading, and the runtime has a method overriding. Okay, so in general if you say overloading and overriding are the only two things that are classified 
in general if you normally ask anyone they would say well, how many types of polymorphism you have some may start with saying it has a compile time it has a run time some very high level guys might say it has an ad hoc polymorphism and parameterized polymorphism because parameterized polymorphism is again an advanced topic so people normally won't uh, talk at that uh, level uh, so people will normally start with the compile time or runtime and some will directly start with saying uh, it has uh, overloading and overriding. So you achieve uh, polymorphism using an overloading and overriding. So we'll see what is an overloading and overriding and uh, also uh, the compile time. Uh, today I'm, I will not be showing the operator overloading uh, which you can do only using C sharp. Um, so probably in next session I will uh, show you a demo wherein you can overload an operator. So we have seen a couple of operators uh, like a plus, minus, uh, division, mod, so on. So we can overload that operator to behave differently based on your context again. So that we can do uh, in a later session. For today we will see uh, the method overloading and method overriding. So method overloading um, is again same thing which is having methods or functions uh, with the same name with the variable parameters varying in data types and the order of data types. So in this case if we say, uh, so these are the two characteristics that you need to keep in mind. So you can vary, uh, you can have the same name with variable signatures or variable data types that you pass as a parameter. So in this case I have a string. Okay, I'll quickly go back uh, to the demo so that we'll do, we can do more there. Okay, so in this case I have a um, um, string and I'm going to uh, define another one with, the, so at this stage if you see uh, and if I try to compile it, uh, I'm getting an error saying already defines a member called start with the same parameter types. So the error is the crystal clear for us to know why this is failing because um, you already have the same name with the same parameter with the same parameter types that's a key thing to know so I can have the same name but if I just change this to a different type then and build it so in this case um, I have overloaded start with the two different data type parameter types so in this case I have a parameter of type string and in this case I have a parameter of type int. So this, uh, if you notice the name really doesn't matter. You can have the same name uh, in, in the parameter name I'm talking about. So the parameter name can be same but it should vary with the data type. And also if you look at the other one. So it has a three parameters to it and okay so I will uh, replicate the same again same three parameters again here okay so here I'm doing something else and uh, here I'm doing something else okay it really doesn't matter right now so I will um, take away the body so that to keep our understanding uh, easily um, see if I, I wrote this code another key thing if you just wanted to uh, show you the difference between the how the uh, the compiler the background compiler works in C sharp versus VB.net right now I don't have the VB.net code for this uh, but if you typically uh, open this uh, do the same code in VB.net it will straight away tell you the error uh, I don't have to explicitly compile this so this background compiler that works in VB.NET uh, compiler which is not there in c .net. So for c .net, if I want to see errors I have to compile it. Okay, so when I once I compile this I, I can able to see the error saying the same error which is the uh, same type of parameters. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to keep the same number of uh, parameters but just um, move the first one to the last. Okay, so in this case I have um, double double string and in this case I have string double double. So I still have the same parameters passed but in the order of the parameters are changed. Okay, and now I compile, now it's good. 
So that's the key difference we need to see. And also another key difference here is um, you cannot actually overload any member with a variable return type. For example, uh, I have this and I will change, make this uh, return type as int. So void returns nothing. So um, I'm just having a, a same name with the same set of parameters with a different return type. Uh, and, oops, sorry. So the compiler doesn't accept. So you cannot overload you using a variable return type with the same set of parameters. Okay, so people uh, will ask uh, some of the people, not everyone, um, especially when, uh, uh, especially, especially for the freshers, whoever are looking for a fresher positions, uh, people will try to play with them uh, asking such uh, typical questions. And uh, most of the time it's very annoying for people uh, because you cannot remember all this uh, thing of variable combinations. So what I'm trying to do here is I'm trying to give you a pretty um, real-time example. Uh, in other words, think about yourself. In this case, uh, we see uh, start. Think about yourself if you have ambiguity. So, okay. If you have, if you see two objects uh, with the same uh, of the same type, like if you have uh, um, two balls uh, sitting in your living room, um, one is uh, 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 yellow, another one is also yellow. Okay, and someone asks you to uh, bring, uh, get me the yellow ball. Okay, you you go to the living room and see two yellow balls and immediately you'll say which yellow ball okay so both are same right both are same wall same size and uh, same dimensions and uh, both are of same color and you will uh, probably because you're a human you can always say okay yellow ball so whichever yellow ball I pick that's fine right doesn't matter but if you're a program you you're, you're not uh, that smart right so you always uh, run on certain para certain um, parameters right you will try to locate uh, uh, same method with the same set of parameters and you see two so when you see two which one you to invoke you don't know you cannot decide okay so that's the same ambiguity the compiler will go in so that's why you cannot have um, a same method uh, with the same set of parameters but you can have a different set of parameters in a different order and so on so different data types and so on so that way you can make it unique you can identify okay this is a method and this is a block you're trying to call and I can go and pick that call so if you think that way then it makes your life easy so written type doesn't matter because the written type uh, really doesn't play uh, in making your method unique because the number of parameters are passed to you when you make a call so if you, if you remember that, when I say start, I pass one string or one string or two doubles. So that's what matters. So whatever you're taking as an instruction, uh, uh, as part of your message. So when I say message passing, that's what it means. So I'm calling this start passing these arguments. So that's a message to the respective object to invoke. Okay, hope that is clear. Uh, yeah, so you cannot have... Uh, you cannot overload uh, methods with uh, uh, with the same uh, name and same parameters, parameter types with a different written type. Okay, and another key thing here. So there's a new keyword that is getting introduced now. What that's a called a virtual. Okay, we'll see uh, what is this virtual keyword. Okay, so now um, so. Another key thing in overloading here is uh, the last one. The overloading can happen within the same class or from derived class. So we did not talk about what is a derived class. Okay, so we'll see uh, what quickly what is a derived class. So I'm going back to the the diagram. This is this is the uh, the architectural edition of the Visual Studio. I'm not sure if you have Express Edition, you might not have this. So uh, you can actually have the uh, diagram view of your code. 
Um, so in this case, um, so if I expand, I can see what all its properties and methods are diagrammatically and uh, also collapse it. Uh, and this is a very good feature um, uh, in Visual Studio. Earlier it was not there. Uh, there were a couple of other tools that were used for your, um, uh, your this is in other words called a case tools, which are computer aided uh, software engineering tools. Um, so uh, this is the class diagram that we are, we are seeing and, uh, and the code that we are trying to uh, have here is the same code that you hear all I need to do is just drag and drop it to this and to add a diagram or if you have uh, the, the architectural edition which comes as part of the Visual Studio professional or enterprise uh, all you need to do is uh, go to the add and pick the diagram We'll have something called a where is class diagram? I missed it somewhere. Yep, here it is. So this is a class diagram. All you need to do is just add it and uh, simply <clears throat> drag and drop your code file, and it will give you the diagram. So it's very simple. Um, so we'll go back here. Okay, so we were talking about um, the overloading and overloading, and uh, we're we're trying to demo uh, show you the inheritance. Okay, so inheritance. Um, in this case, if you see the generalization arrow that we we showed uh, in terms of UML, it's called as a generalization. Uh, wherein uh, your uh, chi uh, your base class, this is the base class. So the automobile becomes your base class or it's called, it's called as a super class. So wherein other members inherit from it. So when they do inheritance, what they do is, if you see the list of properties and methods that are available in the base class, uh, all those uh, characteristics can be uh, inherited in other words, they can access all of its uh, public uh, uh, members within the derived class. So whenever you derive uh, uh, to a super class, the class uh, will become a derived class. So this class is, if you see the arrow, uh, car class, in, you can read this as a inherits automobile. So this is inheriting automobile. So when this inheritance comes, so the automobile becomes the base class, in other words, super class, and the class that is deriving will become a derived class. Okay, so this is the uh, basic concept of inheritance. It's pretty simple. If you uh, compare a real-time world again, um, so again, so it is a basic inheritance. You you inherit uh, the characteristics or look and feel of your parents. In other words, biological inheritance. So this is a very common characteristic that you see. You have some qualities or characteristics uh, uh, that your parents has uh, in terms of a look, color, feel, emotions, behavior. There are so many things that you inherit without your notice. So that's a, is, in other words, some even in that context, some even refer to as a parent and child. So in this case, automobile is a parent class, and class is a, a car class is a child class. So based on the context, uh, their the way they call this uh, will be different. Okay, so we'll, this is uh, inheritance. At this stage, what I'm going to say is uh, the method overloading uh, can happen uh, within the base class or in the derived class. Okay, so uh, overloading in this case, in this typical example, is there anything that I'm overloading? Yeah, if you see a uh, honk, a honk is there in the base class and the honk is there in the derived class. Okay, so uh, I might have a different, uh, um, if you see, uh, the tooltip is trying to give me uh, its signature also. The honk and it's taking only one um, parameter. And in this case, it's taking the same single parameter. So I have a copy of the same uh, uh, member here, which is an overriding again, which is the next topic that we're going to talk. And overloading comes into play, if you say the string uh, start, if you see, the number of overloaded members I have, I have four uh, uh, overloaded members in the base class, 
and and how many I have here? I have only two, so which are which are again actually overriding the base class. So overloading can happen uh, in the base class and also in the derived class. So in this case, uh, okay, I have a different versions of start here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to copy the start and put it in the car. So since car is inheriting from automobile, I'm going to uh, drop it here. So what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to have a second parameter. Okay. Okay. In the say something. Okay, so I'm just uh, having a different um, signature set here. I have a single parameter set, I have a double parameter set, and I have a triple parameter set here. And I just added a second one. And this is in the derived class. Okay, and I compile this program and it, it's still good. Okay, so what I did here is nothing but uh, I actually have created another virtual member. Okay, so we were talking about what is a virtual here. So virtual is a keyword that you need to specify to the members uh, in your base class so that the derived class can overload or override them. Okay. So in this case, uh, since I don't have the over overloaded member of start with two parameters, I can able to actually have a virtual member here because this is a brand new member. So in this case, I actually overloaded the start in the derived class. Okay. So overload can happen uh, across the inheritance hierarchy, wherein the derived class and, uh, and base class. So the virtual keyword must be there. Otherwise, you cannot um, override in the derived class. So uh, in this case, uh, this is the overriding. So wherein, wherein this can happen only in the derived classes. Okay. So you, you have base class automobile, and uh, the automobile should be virtual here. Then only you can actually override from your derived class class a uh, car. So the car, I have to use an override keyword to override the base class implementation. So in this new member, it is a virtual for me. Okay, so in this uh, uh, new case here, uh, it is uh, virtual because it's brand new here. And if I say override here, what will happen? And compile this, it doesn't say it, um, it's valid. Uh, it's no suitable method found to override. So it is actually override keyword identify, try to look up for the uh, same method on in your base class to override. Okay, so it's not allowed. And another thing, what will happen if I remove the override keyword here for start and compile again? So it again says, so because, um, okay, let me open up. So cannot override inherited member where it is actually throwing the error in the derived class saying, you cannot override because the base class member is not virtual. Okay, uh, because it is not marked virtual, abstract, or override. Okay, so your base class member is not virtual, so you cannot override it. So it is key to have a virtual members. Only virtual members can be overload, uh, override in the derived class. Otherwise, they cannot. So there you have the control on which member you want to allow, which member you want to allow others to override its implementation and write its own. So by the way, what is override again? So that's a key thing here. So override, what I'm doing here is I'm doing some action in the base class as a virtual. So uh, I inherited from the uh, from the uh, from the automobile here, and I want to write my own implementation. 
because I, I, I don't want the base class uh, implementation that is provided. So what I'm going to do is I, I will write my own implementation. Sometimes I want a flavor of both. Okay, so I want the base class to do its own job and also write my own functionality. So, um, so in this case, what I'm going to do is I have to go back and fix this and then, oops, sorry, I just have to build this, nothing else. So I just have to compile that and it's good and we'll uh, see the demo, how that's going to work. This is the polymorphism code. Okay, so to keep our thing simple, I will not go to a truck and the flying car for now. I will just hide them, comment them out, and uh, what I'm trying to do here is, now it is a more realistic wherein I have a car, and in this case, I will uh, turn my automobile to abstract, which makes a real sense, right? Because the other block which I uh, commented out uh, was actually using instance of the uh, automobile. That was that's why it was failing. So when I'm getting into the polymorphism, I'm trying to make it more meaningful uh, uh, class relationship here. So in this case, I'm creating instance of a car. So which uh, so nowhere I'm creating instance of automobile as we discussed abstract members cannot be instantiated directly. So abstract, when I make my class abstract, that means I always want them to be base class of some other classes. So this becomes my base class um, and I cannot create instance of it. So that's part of the abstraction that we discussed. Okay, uh, and uh, the car instance here, the car class is actually Okay, let me collapse this. Um, is inherited from automobile and it ha actually overrides the base class implementations. Okay, and in this case, I'm actually creating instance of the car. Okay, so automobile as a concept, it has some of the uh, attributes uh, given to me and I'm making use of them. So in this case, uh, car, I just have only one prop property, uh, which is category. So otherwise, uh, I can able to, uh, as part of the inheritance, I'm still able to access the make model category. So category is my car specific implementation, whereas make and model are base class implementations. So, so hope that makes it clear. So that's achieved using inheritance since car is getting inherited from automobile. So I'll try, take this out. So if I don't inherit, what will happen? So everything else go for a toss because uh, in the first place uh, all these uh, base dot start I'm trying to call uh, is gone because uh, this start is actually available only in the automobile not in the car and even the start is gone so all these code blocks have failed and uh, most importantly where is my code Oh yeah, so if you see this, uh, even the make and model is errorsome, but not the category, because the category is the implementation of car, not the base class. So if I, again, inherit uh, car from automobile, then everything is back. So that indicates that all the properties and attributes that are available in automobile are inherited by car so in this case, what I'm doing is I'm actually extending the uh, base class methods or base class uh, functionality. So base class state and behavior, I have uh, the ability to extend them using inheritance. So in, in UML terms, it is referred to as a specialization. So when whenever you do uh, inheritance and implement the base class member, it becomes a specialized class of the base class. So in, in other context, we saw it's a child class. So in other context, we call it as a derived class. So so one. So it has a multiple meanings at the different contexts or different uh, way you use it. So car is a specialized cl class of automobile. 
car is a derived class of automobile or car is a child of automobile. So all stands same. And in this case I have a um, state definition wherein I have only category. Okay, and the behavior I'm trying to override the base class implementations because I, I in this case I want to have the base class member implementation. Uh, this is calling the base class start and also calling the my own member here. Okay, so we'll try to run this code. So if you see, I just added the uh, the right line. Um, um, uh, in such a way that uh, the output makes sense for me from where I'm calling. Okay, so I just had a, a class name here uh, as a constant. If I see, I just added a class name within the car. I'm just naming it as a car, and in automobile, I just have the same uh, uh, constant class name as automobile. And what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to write down that name. Uh, the class name in my output. So the output is pretty much uh, writing the class name and the uh, values of that instance down the line. So it's actually trying to write down the make uh, instance name that I'm passing in which is C1 or C2 so on uh, and the make model current uh, location which is uh, we will talk about this type uh, later on. So this is a kind of a, a nested type. We will talk about at the end of the session um, and uh, properties and number of wheels uh, so on. So I'm trying to uh, put down uh, all the values that I'm uh, getting here or in, uh, initialized. So it, it shows me <coughs> that so when I when it's uh, when I invoke this code let me go back to the polymorphism demo okay, here. Okay, so here uh, this is where I'm setting the values which I'm defining the state, setting the state of C1. So C1 is reflected here. This is the instance name because that's the name I'm passing in at the methods. Uh, start, honk and uh, open trunk, right? Um, so when I hit the start, C1.start, so this is C1.start with single parameter, okay? Um, C1.start wherein I pass only C1 there and it invoke the um, the automobile base class. So the implementation here is actually calling the base dot start. Okay, that's the reason it actually invoked the automobile in uh, version of the C1 dot start. And uh, after that, um, I'm writing something here console dot write line, which is from the car instance or uh, car class. And so you invoke the base class implementation as well as the current implementation using the override. Okay, so I can straight away even avoid doing this. So in vb.net this is called shadowing. Okay, so I will just uh, take this away and compile this and run this. So now I see I don't see automobile in the first place because I didn't call base class implementation. I straight away call the car implementation. Okay, so this is called uh, in VB.NET shadowing or uh, in, um, in uh, polymorphism terms it is a overriding. Okay, so this is about uh, overriding and we have already seen overloading and uh, next uh, topic uh, inheritance. So other way around, we already talked about the inheritance. Uh, uh, what is a uh, base class? What is the derived class? Super class, and so on. Um, so we, we are, I think, we are familiar with that uh, inheritance uh, concept right now. And you achieve that using uh, uh, in VB.NET. I didn't uh, unfortunately show you the VB.NET uh, code. Um, uh, so you can actually you can take that as a homework uh, to translate this C sharp into VB.NET. So do you know what is the shortcut to translate uh, um, vb.net to C-sharp code? Uh, you don't really have to write it. If you want to really uh, see that there are very interesting tools online which can... Uh, where is this?
Okay, if I see convert C sharp to web.net. Okay, so there there are uh, tools. There are a wide variety of tools actually available, which where you can uh, use to convert the C sharp code to web.net. Uh, in this case, for example, uh, yeah, if I say public override and this stuff, I will just put here and say convert to vb.net so it's going to give me the vb.net code so in this case uh, overrides is the keyword that is needed uh, for override so th this is just a keyword mismatch otherwise uh, everything is same uh, all the uh, examples that we are doing in C sharp is doable in vb.net also so there is nothing that um, language specific um, support is completely there from both the languages. Okay, uh, so inheritance, uh, we'll see how many types of inheritance we have. Okay, so the types of inheritance we see uh, here, uh, we have about five types of inheritance that you can do uh, conceptually. Uh, the first one is a single inheritance or a single level in other words so single inheritance wherein um, uh, class A and class B you have and B is inheriting A so it's only one level or a single level and uh, which we have done so far say so automobile in this case and car in this case okay and multi level is a type of inheritance wherein you can have A B C lined up in a uh, multi level and uh, wherein uh, 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 C inherits B and B inherits C A. So what will happen in this case is C is pretty much uh, A plus B. Okay, so it is a composite class which contains all the members of B and also all the members of A. So that's how um, you can achieve uh, uh, using multi-level inheritance, and there is no limit how many levels you can go. Okay, and uh, a hybrid is supposed to be the last topic, but um, since it's here, we'll see hybrid is a mix of um, uh, multi-level and single level. Um, so in this case, if we say a, uh, C inherits A is a single level and B inherits A is a single level uh, and D inherits B inherits uh, A is a multi-level. So it's a mix of both. Uh, so that becomes a hybrid uh, inheritance. So this is doable. Um, how it is doable because uh, at a g any given point you see only one class is inheriting the other class okay uh, even B is inheriting A and C is inheriting A so which is uh, perfectly doable in C sharp dot or VB dot net and uh, the next is a hierarchical hierarchical uh, if you see even hybrid contains hierarchical wherein A uh, B and C are inheriting A uh, this even represents the single inheritance also wherein A is inheriting oh sorry B is inheriting A and C is inheriting A so this is a pretty much hierarchical which you normally see in a uh, hierarchical representation of a you know office structure or organization structure wherein the uh, the chairman or CEO starts first and those uh, break down into structures right so that's a hierarchical in, uh, inheritance you can do this and the last one is the multiple inheritance. So multiple inheritance is a, a little uh, complex here. So wherein uh, one class is actually inheriting from two different classes at the same time. So C is trying to inherit from multiple classes. Okay, none of the other inheritance were doing that. So this is a special case which is doable perfectly in uh, or small talk. Um, programming languages and which is not doable in uh, .NET uh, or even Java. So Java also doesn't support multiple inheritance this way wherein one class is uh, derived from uh, two other classes or more than two classes so which is not possible in uh, .NET. Okay um, so if you want to demo let's see and in this case, as per my class diagram, I have a um, truck, car, automobile, and a flying car. Okay, what I'll do is I will add another car, and uh, while adding, I will also show you uh, how to use the architectural view of the class diagram to create classes. Okay, so instead of going to the code, I'm going to do visually. 
So I, I'll just wanted to see the toolbox and if you see there is a set of tools here I can straight away drag one class here and I will name something uh, what do I do uh, okay I'll say something like special this is a special class uh, which contains uh, which want to inherit both from truck and car okay let's try it out this way and it's actually creating a separate file for each class okay so if you see Although you can have multiple classes within the same file, it is not recommended to have. It's always recommended to have a separate class. Uh, that way you can have a easy readability of your code. And I have created a class and also it has created me the code file, if you see, visually and programmatically. So both are in sync. And at the same time, now I want to do inherit. Uh, so I'm going to drag this tool and inherit from truck okay and also drag this and try to inherit car so if you see this is a little smart so it's not letting me do that even graphically so when I try to add a new inheritance to another car it is not it is actually shifting the inheritance from either this or that so that means graphically it is enforcing the uh, the rule that multiple inheritance is not supported in .NET so what will happen if I forcefully do it and compile this it doesn't go anywhere so what I can do is as an alternative I can actually have an interface so interface what is an interface so interfaces as we have seen um, uh, as we have seen the abstract class uh, abstract class and interface have a very thin gap between each so both cannot be created instance, both are used for abstract layer and in this case what I'm going to do is um, I will have an interface called uh, what for example if you think of a better example that can map to the real world with respect to the automobile um, I'll say body shop Okay, so all of these uh, need a body shop, so I just define a body shop as an interface. Okay, so within the body, um, so I'm just right clicking, adding a method, say, um, okay, fix, uh, fix the body, just say fix the body uh, as a method. Okay, and uh, okay. Let me add one more uh, method saying um, paint. Okay, so body shop. These are these are the kind of things that they normally do. And uh, if you remember, if you see, it's so intuitive that if I pick the methods, then it'll let me add only method. And to add any other, I can go ahead and add a property also, saying uh, is. So this indicates that um, uh, fix the um, um, uh, fix the, fixed it or not. So I'm just trying to go and uh, set up the properties. Uh, if you see, it's a read and write pro uh, write accessor and uh, so on. So you can just play around and uh, uh, type by default. It has taken the int as a data type. I'm going to change it as a bool. Okay. And I can put some comments here, remarks, so on, which can reflect, um, and so on. So it's pretty uh, decent. So if you say, if you have this tool, you don't have to really go and write a code. It's going to do for yourself, right? So that's the uh, advantage with the, uh, with this architectural uh, car uh, class diagram view. And now I have the interface created. So it shows here. So what I can do here is, um, I cannot uh, uh, inherit uh, multiple classes, but I can inherit to my interfaces. So it's already added a link there. If you say car, body shop, 
So it's actually an error, uh, actually speaking, because I uh, wrote a code saying car, it's trying to show something, but it is not able to do it because that's an error. I'm going to take that away and uh, fix this, okay? Okay, truck is less accessible than the, okay, special class where this truck is not accessible for it. We'll see that. So I have this uh, okay it's inheriting this and um, that's how I can have uh, uh, I can actually have multiple uh, inherit uh, uh, a class to multiple interfaces but I can inherit only one class so that's the rule and the difference between uh, the abstract and interface uh, probably I will uh, show you in the next session um, to keep it simple for this session, uh, the only difference between them is that the abstract class can have a concrete members whereas a interface cannot have a concrete members within it. So if I look at the definition of uh, the interface, uh, where is this body shop? So if you see this is a body shop, so it can have uh, uh, properties and everything just like uh, any normal class. Uh, and also remember that uh, you cannot create instance of this because interfaces and abstract classes uh, are used for as an abstract layer. So as we discussed, abstract layer cannot really exist in the real world. So in theoretically, so that's why they cannot be instantiated. So only you can do is you can inherit and implement their uh, behavior. So in this case, interfaces can have only the signature here. And whoever uh, inherits uh, this, they need to implement the body of the signature to uh, gain that, um, uh, to make this uh, definition a real meaning. Otherwise, uh, interfaces will never have any concrete implementations. They just have a signature body. Whereas abstract members like the automobile here, this is an abstract member, but it has a concrete members within it. When I say concrete, it means they have a body. So if the bar, if the signal, if the if your method has a body, then this becomes a concrete method. Otherwise, it becomes an abstract method. So an abstract class can have an abstract methods and also concrete methods, whereas uh, interfaces can have only uh, abstract members, not the concrete members. So that's the key difference between an um, um, uh, interface and abstract. And this is a very, very commonly asked question. Um, and believe me, all, all these uh, keywords, topics we have been discussing, they are all you know, perfectly 100% interview questions and people will definitely ask you. No doubt about it, they will definitely ask you. Uh, so remember that. And uh, probably I'll have a question poll uh, on this topic in the next session. And uh, we will move on with the, so we covered the inheritance part as well. So we are good there. And yes, so this is a kind of an add-on as part of my uh, um, curriculum or the topics for discussion. I added this as a uh, bonus or addition, um, uh, which is an object-based programming. Um, so we have so far seen an um, object-oriented programming and uh, the concept of object-based programming is a one step back to the object-oriented programming. So the differences between uh, object-oriented and based uh, is a very thin, uh, very narrow again and uh, uh, in the object-based uh, programming it's pretty much a language or a theory uh, which, uh, which is again based on the concepts. Uh, concept of the object and the object based programming language encourages a methodology methodological uh, methodology sorry methodology for uh, designing and creating a program as a set of autonomous uh, components so if you see if you uh, look at the modular approach of writing programs uh, this is uh, programming languages in the in the early in, in the early version of Visual Basic and uh, Hex is one of the very old one which I'm not even aware of. Um, uh, I just got that, uh, but I'm very well aware of Visual Basic. Uh, I worked on Visual Basic, the Lexi, 
uh, language and uh, pretty well know what is uh, what is it capable of. Um, so that's uh, that could be my reference point uh, with respect to the object-based programming. Um, and uh, the only difference is that if you look at in terms of the object-oriented programming language is that this doesn't support a couple of um, uh, features like the inheritance. Uh, so Visual Basic doesn't have the inheritance uh, capability, although it can still have the define the classes, create instance of them, become objects. You can do a overloading, overriding. You can do all of this polymorphism. You can do encapsulation. You can do uh, abstraction. You can do, but you cannot uh, uh, do inheritance. So uh, that's when. Um, it became an object-based programming, but it's not an object-oriented programming. So an object-oriented programming should satisfy all of those uh, seven characteristics. Out of them, uh, again, the, one of the highly debatable uh, topic is that the multiple inheritance is one of the debatable topic, wherein uh, Java doesn't support, VB.NET doesn't support, uh, C Sharp doesn't support, even any .NET languages doesn't support. But although they doesn't support multiple inheritance, they are they claim that they are object oriented or 100% object oriented programming because they have a workaround of using interfaces and uh, they uh, who the the respective compilers really uh, make their own point why it is uh, not uh, uh, supporting multiple inheritance uh, the wide variety of uh, arguments go fly around uh, saying um, uh, it reduces the complexity of a program uh, in one sense so that you limit your uh, level of uh, uh, inheritance hierarchy. So as the level of inheritance hierarchy grow, uh, the complexity of the code also grows. So to address that, um, uh, they got rid of the multiple inheritance because uh, C++ 100% support multiple inheritance. Okay, so that's a FYI. Uh, add on to it and object based programming is all about um, um, that and it's a more modular approach uh, but it has some features of the object uh, um, oriented programming and the next one is a very new and latest which is uh, aspect oriented programming so things have been evolving over a period of time and uh, key thing to keep in mind when you talk about aspect oriented programming um, is that uh, this is not a replacement to object-oriented programming. So object-oriented programming has some uh, uh, flaws in sense. Uh, it is programmatically not possible to, not 100% possible to achieve the um, uh, separation of concern. If you new to that, uh, separation of concern is one of the basic design principles, which is also the first principle of solid principles. So, solid principles is a set of five principles which are which falls as a backbone for all the programming design. Um, probably that's my plan to cover that area in the advanced topics. Uh, so, the first principle is a separation of concern, uh, wherein the responsibility of each of the module or class that it is trying to do is isolated from one another. So you, uh, that uh, the concern is separated from one uh, object to another object so that you achieve the reusability aspect and reduce the redundancy. So that's a base principle for programming or designing uh, your uh, program. Um, so um, separation of concern is one of the major problem when you design uh, or a pro write a program using the object-oriented programming. Uh, I'll give a quick example of, um, uh, for example, uh, uh, in as by default, uh, object-oriented program is completely of classes and objects. There is, there is no such thing that you can uh, something hang in air. Like if you have, if you want to have a helper method, for example, that writes say information to a log file, or a helper method, uh, helper classes or helper methods that can talk to a database and get you some information. You know, it, which is uh, really not a a re real-time object that represents in the real world. So these are all called as a cross-cutting concerns. So the cross-cutting concerns is one of the concerns in the, uh, while designing the uh, program in a true object-oriented principles. Because as per the principles, it all talks about uh, having class 
uh, represent the real world object. So these things like exception handling or logging or database interactions, these are a couple of uh, concerns that you really need in a program but cannot fall under any of these principles. So that those are the cross-cutting concerns which are like a big bottleneck when you write a, a dot and program. So what that means is, in uh, although uh, I have my domain object model which is reflecting to the real-time objects uh, with respect to my business context, for example, I'm doing a payroll application and my context is, deals with the employee and their payroll information. Uh, so all the entities involved in the payroll uh, payroll generation like employee, salary uh, and uh, so on, so paychecks and so on. So there are a lot of uh, nouns involved in the payroll processing. So all these objects, uh, they reflect the real world uh, scenario, but where the logging or exception handling or all other things fall like uh, intermediate to all of these. So every one of these need to uh, implement a logging, implement exception handling or implement database access and so on. So they are all uh, 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 crossing around all these uh, uh, domain uh, entities. So that's why they're called cross-cutting uh, concerns. So they're actually spanning from one layer to other layer or one object to the other object. So they are uh, intermediate to one another but again separation of concern is again a bottleneck there because I cannot write a, a a employee class without using a logging in th in simple terms. In in my example also I am trying to use a console.write line which is actually writing something to the uh, output, right? So that's again a separation of concept. So what this object is supposed to do is not doing, it is doing more than that because it needs to do. So, so aspect oriented programming is, go, is trying to address that flaw uh, in the object oriented programming. So it has a pretty much uh, uh, the terminology goes, so one of the terminology we already discussed the cross-cutting concerns, another one is uh, is defines an advice, and advice is um, is an additional code which is like a logging or exception handling, so this is an additional code uh, that can be uh, referred to as an advice, that's a terminology used in aspect oriented programming. And the point cut is uh, another keyword which refers to the location or the line of code or, pro uh, or program execution point where you want to introduce the advice. Okay, so the advice is, for example, a logging or uh, any helper method that you want to add. Okay, the point where you want to add it is the uh, point cut. And the aspect as a um, keyword itself is a union of both. Um, so it's a combination of a point cut and advice. So aspect is the place where you want to uh, introduce an additional line of code uh, at what time and where you want to add. So that's the aspect oriented programming concept, uh, conceptually. Um, but who all supports this kind of uh, uh, program? Uh, this language. Again, uh, this is um, paradigm of programming principles. So the the well-known as on today is the aspect J, which is for Java. Uh, that's the only language that is a true aspect oriented programming language and the rest of them, even including .NET, um, they actually doesn't support um, uh, the aspect oriented programming. Uh, but though uh, still the way the, the .NET infrastructure is set up, it is not a very uh, uh, difficult to achieve it. Uh, it's uh, again achievable using uh, um, there's something called a Unity framework, um, uh, which is a part of the dependency injection module, uh, wherein you can actually inject a couple of modules at runtime um, that can achieve the cross-cutting concerns. So at a runtime. So in other words, uh, it, if you have an assembly 1 and assembly B, so assembly A is your uh, domain object model, okay? And assembly B is your cross-cutting concern. So I'm separating both the concerns. So I will write my exception logic only in the assembly B, and uh, assembly A is again completely going to be my business specific objects, okay? So I'm not uh, mixing, a, a playing a mix and match here. So what the compiler expected to do is 
at the end when they compile both these assemblies they need to be uh, un uh, uh, combined and delivered a new uh, deliver a new assembly which will mix and match both uh, which will specify where to introduce my aspect okay so that's a part of the point cut point cut and advice so you'll have you will define the advice in the assembly B and also you define the uh, point cut information where this need to be injected in point assembly A and you compile them and the, uh, the re resulted assembly will have the uh, uh, assembly with the uh, both the union or uh, uni unioning the in inserting the respective uh, aspect at the point cut in, in the assembly A. So that's the uh, level of uh, approach uh, to achieve the cross cutting concerns of, uh, at the same time satisfying the uh, the first principle called the separation of concern. I hope you got that information uh, into your memory. So unfortunately, I cannot deliver more than that uh, in this aspect because this is just an overview and FYI. And uh, this is gaining a lot of weight in the market uh, down the line. So this my but again, remember that this is not actually uh, replacing the object-oriented programming language. Okay, so it is. Uh, it is supporting the object oriented programming language so this aspect oriented program is an is an add on to the obj, uh, sorry aspect oriented program is an add on to the oop so it's not replacing it so keep that in mind and of course as i mentioned so in dotnet there are workarounds uh, wherein you can use to uh, achieve the aspect oriented uh, uh, principles uh, but uh, straight away .NET doesn't support so the straight away the true uh, aspect oriented programming is a aspect J which is available for Java okay so that's all for now uh, we did walk through the object oriented programming and now overview of all the different um, uh, concepts within object oriented program uh, the starting with class, object, uh, message passing, encapsulation, abstraction, polymorphism, and inheritance are the key seven uh, characteristics an OOP uh, language should possess. And we will see what's a class in a different dimension. So the class to have a state and behavior. And we will see a very good examples of uh, a class and what is an object, uh, an, an instance of a given class with a real-time uh, car blueprint uh, to the cars as an object in, re in the real-world differences. And we did see uh, about an object in the real-time code, how it looks like. And also we did see the message passing, what it really means. And we did walk through the encapsulation principle and uh, what are the advantages of that having uh, to have uh, defined and encapsulated uh, properties. And uh, we did see the abstraction with a very real-time uh, example, like the animal classification here. And another example uh, we did see as an animal classification for abstraction. And we did see a core examples uh, also for the automobile industry, uh, having an automobile as an abstract class and the rest of the other uh, concrete members, uh, concrete classes inheriting from the automobile uh, in general. And uh, yes, and we did see the polymorphism and how it can be broke down into the ad hoc polymorphism and parameterized polymorphism and the uh, and drill down into the ad hoc poly polymorphism. We did see the compile time and the runtime polymorphisms. The runtime is a method overriding, whereas the compile time has uh, two different uh, distinctions. Uh, one is an operator overloading and the other one is a method overloading. So all this uh, uh, in very detail we did walk through. And we just see the types of uh, uh, polymorphism. Yeah, this is with an example. So with, uh, uh, we, we did also uh, look into the virtual keyword in general for, especially when we do the method overriding. And uh, we did see the inheritance. Uh, what is the significance of inheritance in OOP and what are different types of inheritance? We have which is a single inheritance, multi-level inheritance, uh, hybrid inheritance, uh, hierarchical inheritance, and multiple inheritance. And we did also see that the multiple inheritance is not supported in .NET. And uh, to uh, to achieve it, the workaround is to make use of interfaces. 
and we did see what is an object based programming as an overview with a specific example to visual basic and we did see what is an aspect oriented programming which is something that's in the uh, future and which is, which is uh, having a rich cross cutting uh, uh, problems or so, or solutions within this and the, uh, the, the current most popular one is the aspect J for, uh, for Java uh, and uh, String.net out there in the market to support the aspect oriented programming. And uh, that's all about today's session and we'll continue with the uh, forthcoming topics in the next session.